like to thank organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's been a, a long travel for me to come here. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about something I've been thinking about for a while. It's, uh, it's primarily a, a method for uh, making predictions uh, accurately and at scale. And the methods that I'll, I'm going to de describe are not at all deep. Actually, they're extremely shallow. So they don't burn too much computation, but they perform extremely well. And hopefully, my hope is that by the end of my 15, 20 minutes, I'll convey you how you would do it. Uh, if you are a retailer, and if you are interested in figuring out how you can apply some of these things to uh, improve your performances, and there by there, you can sort of bring your uh, bottom line up by more than 6%, uh, you could reach out at our uh, company's website or contact me. Okay. So now I'll uh, wear my academic hat uh, as a professor at MIT. And before I dive into the details of the method, let me just quickly sort of uh, do the ground zero first. So uh, let's see if this works. Not really. Well, maybe he can click it. I was joking with him. That sort of <laughs> All right. Um, so here's the state, right? We got lots of data, and we figured out how to warehouse it. We spent a lot of money, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of cleverness to figure out how to infrastructure, uh, uh, how to warehouse it well, how to query it well, and maybe compute with it well. Okay. Uh, the question is that what we really want to do is to take this data and actually make certain decisions, the decisions that will be useful for whatever the task that you are interested in. Okay. And this is where the benefit of all the hard work that you, uh, one has done to get sort of data access easy, infrastructure built out. Okay. Uh, how would one go about doing, uh, making decisions? Uh, I grew up as a probabilist and statistician. So the way I would think about it is a very standard statistical decision theory where I would take a data, I will build a model. A model will help me understand what the data looks like and then use that to do prediction and then make eventual decisions. So for example, again, going back to the Retail world, so if you are a, a large retailer, think of yourself as a Macy's. You've got thousands of stores in the country. Uh, do you want to take a guess how many products you would sell in this kind of stores in one year? 100,000? Million? Sometimes you sell more, more than hundreds of millions of products. Now you've got to figure out, out of these thousands of stores, where each one of them can carry only 100,000 products each at a given point of time, which products you would put where, and how many of them, how would you price them, and so on. That's a massive decision problem. You've got a lot of data about your customers. Question is that how would you make a prediction of how people make choices at these different stores? Because that would determine what would you put where, and how much, and how you would price it. Okay? So it's, this is the type of decision that you want to make from your data. And the question is, how do you do accurate predictions with the amount of data that you've collected? And you do that at scale and very well. Sounds very easy. Um, not exactly, because here are the two uh, uh, basic challenges. One, data is usually unstructured. So as a classical statistician, you might say, that, well, maybe I'll build some reasonable regression model. Uh, maybe as a neural nets person, you might think, that, well, I'll build some of the neural nets and figure out, and I'll spend a lot of time training it. But again, that requires, that's an art. So the question is, there, is there a way to sort of bypass that art? And then second is, it's a large amount of data, so whatever you do, you don't want to uh, spend too much amount of compute. The question is that, can you do it uh, cheaply? And then do these things together while uh, doing predictions accurately. Okay, and uh, the method that I'm going to describe is classical method, what one would call a Bayesian regression. Uh, the twist is that the underlying model that you use to run this Bayesian regression method is what we call a latent source model. Uh, what I'm going to do in remaining time, primarily take you through two examples, where uh, one is how would you use this method to trade bitcoins, hopefully profitably, and second is uh, how would you predict trends in Twitter, uh, and that will hopefully convince you that this is a very good method. Okay? All right. So first, let's start with bitcoins. So just a quick primer. I'm sure all of you don't know anything about bitcoin. Uh, so bitcoin is a... Uh, it's a cryptographic virtual currency. Um, if you followed a recent article in Times, there's a nice, uh, <laughs> a nice um, a social thing about who is this uh, Elias, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, and everybody's trying to figure that out. Um, 
uh, it's an unregulated currency, uh, which is good and bad depending on how you look at it. So, for example, um, um, if if I'm in uh, I'm a wealthy politician in India, maybe I want to use bitcoins so that I sort of uh, I'm, I don't come under the law which says that I'm a system as an input to my uh, an output. If my output is or the amount of wealth that I have is more than my input and output, then there is something wrong. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this can be purchased over a handful of uh, exchanges. Um, you can actually get data publicly, freely, in detail. You can know exactly every transaction, order books, and so on. That is one of the reasons why we chose this, because we wanted detailed information about what's going on there. Uh, its uh, market cap is large, and uh, daily volume of transactions is large. It suggests that it's an efficient market. Uh, so that means that predicting price in this kind of an efficient setting is a challenge. Okay, so it's a well-posed setting. Got all information I want uh, easily available. It's efficient market, which means that prediction is not so straightforward. All the traditional models from statistics will fail in uh, predicting uh, prices going forward. Uh, so the question was that, is the price really predictable or is it just a white noise out there? And if so, can I sort of use that prediction and make a decision of sort of trading well? Okay, so that's a very simple uh, question. Right, uh, to keep uh, all the focus on prediction rather than the, it's the strategy we use, the strategy that I'm going to use is ve uh, very, very simple. So what I will do is that I'll, okay, here's what we did. Uh, we collected data for roughly five months uh, last year. It's about price of Bitcoin. Also, we get uh, order book information. There's the best, 60 best uh, ask and bid and the volume of them. And then this roughly adds up to 200 million points converted into evenly uh, spaced time series. So now I've got a high dimensional time series. And now I want to use this to figure out uh, whether I can sort of predict this price as well. Okay. Uh, again, to keep things simple, as in just figuring out how well can we predict, the trading strategy I'm going to use is extremely simple. At each point of time, I will hold a position of plus one, zero, or minus one. That is, either I have bought a Bitcoin I have no state, there's no stakes in it, or I have shorted one. Okay? And I will not have anything more than that, because otherwise I can start playing with a somewhat fancier strategies, uh, maintaining reasonable portfolios, and that can lead to better performance just because of the portfolio rather than the, my predictability. Okay. At each time, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out uh, over next short time interval whether price is going to go up, go down. In particular, I'll predict the change in the price. If it's uh, going, becoming larger than some small threshold, I'm going to decide to buy a Bitcoin if my position is zero or minus one. If it's one, I can't buy it because I have restricted myself to just one Bitcoin. If it's less than a threshold, uh, rather minus threshold, sorry for the typo, and my position is greater than or equal to zero, is I have one Bitcoin or I have nothing, then I will short one. Okay? It's as simple a strategy as it gets. Any questions? Okay, now the whole question is that how do we predict the price? Um, I'm not going to show you that for a second. This is where the method comes. But uh, let's see how well does this do. So here is um, uh, here's a chart where there's a time. Uh, so remember, I had data from uh, February to July. What we did for, we took the data from February to uh, beginning of May and used that as a training data. And once we trained it, we ran the strategy causally uh, from May to uh, roughly June end. During that, I have, so x-axis is the time. There are two y-axis I'm plotting. Let's look at the first y-axis on this side that is on your left-hand side. That's the price of Bitcoin in yuan. This is uh, OKCoin exchange in China, so yuan. And uh, the blue uh, time series is uh, depicting the price of the Bitcoin during that time. Um, on the right-hand side, the y-axis um, depicts the total cumulative profit that we made during that time. And the, uh, the gray slash black line that predicts the cumulative profit that we are making. And the uh, summary is that by doing average investment of uh, 3,700, we made 3,300 over 50 days. So that's 89% uh, uh, return. And it's a reasonable return if I may say so. Okay. Now, if you are uh, from 
uh, quant world, you will say, well, uh, maybe you, it was a fluke. Maybe there are few things, few trades that helped you make a lot of money. So how well is your strategy doing really in terms of its, uh, um, its variation? One way to measure variation is uh, calculate sharp ratio. And the sharp ratio is four. Now, if you, if you know what sharp ratio is and if you have uh, ever focused on sharp ratios for your own investments, portfolios, et cetera, sharp ratio of two is pretty good because that's what you would do if you were doing a retirement investment in. Okay, so this is a reasonably stable uh, uh, proxy. And I've got five minutes. Okay, um, so that's a summary of uh, the, uh, how well that does in, uh, on the Bitcoin prediction. Let me tell you another case study. So if you want to predict trends in Twitter, so the, uh, as you know, trends in Twitter are the following, right? At some point of time, Twitter says that, well, here's a handle that's, uh, that's, uh, that's trending, okay? So that's like, a, uh, that's like a dashboard. It's like a NASDAQ saying that here's the price of your stock, okay? And what I want to do is that before it, a topic becomes trending, I want, to I want to predict whether it will become trending and it will reach... The, uh, the dashboard of uh, uh, Twitter itself. Okay. All right. Uh, here are some popular topics that we know that became trending. This one would call memes. Uh, what we were interested in is predicting effectively uh, words or n-grams, in particular two to four grams, that would become trending. Okay. So for example, uh, hashtag Barclay, that became uh, trending at some point of time a uh, few years back. Uh, if you remember uh, news from then, there was a time when Barclay was uh, heavily fined. I think it was like the largest reported fine in the banking history uh, uh, for uh, manipulations of Uribor LIBOR uh, uh, exchange rates. Okay, clearly this news was announced at some point of time um, in Britain, GMT. If you're British, you would notice that. Uh, and uh, on Twitter, the topic... Barclays become, uh, became trending, and Twitter announced it at 12.49 the local time. It's GMT. Okay, now the question is that, can we look at this history and figure out maybe here somewhere, or here somewhere, or here, or maybe here, that it's actually likely to become trending? Okay. And uh, again, you can apply exactly the same method to figure out whether something is going to become trending or not. And as per our method, we found that the, this topic for this particular thing becomes trending roughly 45 minutes in advance. Now again, one could ask the question, is this one special instance or is it a generic phenomenon? So uh, at that time we had access to Firehose because it was, an, uh, it was a great agreement between MIT and Twitter where I could sit in my office and have access then, uh, not anymore. But since we had that window, there was the month of June. So here's what we did, we took, uh, in the month of June we took all the topics that became trending. Then we took roughly equal number of topics that did not become trending. You have to sample them carefully, otherwise you will generate biases. So we did that too. And then now we've created two, two sets of things, um, things that trended and things that did not trend. Okay? And now I can causally provide the information about those things to my system to ask it to predict. And it may never predict, it may say that sort of, I'm never going to say that this is going to trend. Or I may say at some point that it's going to trend. And if here are the few types of errors that can happen. Something never trended, and I will say trending. Uh, something never trend, something trended, and I will never say trending. And so on, right? So the four types of things. Uh, question is that how well does our system do? Uh, well, one method that sort of all of us know that will do extremely well in terms of uh, predicting trending topics. What would that be? You will be always right when you will say that something is trending. Well, for everything you say, it's trending. So that's not, uh, that's not sort of, uh, if you can predict accurately that 95% of the time, if something is going to trend, you will say trending. That's not great unless I tell you something like this. That is when things are not becoming trending, I will say only 4% of the time that it's not becoming trending. And if you have looked at these, uh, these, kind, of, uh, uh, these kind of curves or FPR, TPR plots, this you would say it's pretty respectable. Um, and this was, again, sort of with uh, very little training data. Um, it was primarily 600 data points that we used to train. And then it did this well over a variety of topics uh, for an entire month. Okay. All right. So now I've got seven seconds. And 
I want to say, how does it work? Uh, so I'm going to quickly flip through slides. Uh, no, 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 sorry. I, I, it was not a joke. <laughs> I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. All right, so in, in the context of, I'll take three, minus three seconds. Here's how you would do. Roughly speaking, you're seeing a time series that's sort of historic. Uh, this, sorry, that's current time series, and you want to predict how well it will do going forward. I've got a bunch of time segments that are available from past. All I will do is I'll think of these as quotes and quotes at some level experts and somehow fuse this information together along with this to produce this prediction. That fusing can be done completely in parallel. So it's effectively simple arithmetic operations. Uh, so if you had an embarrassingly parallel scalable system, this will do extremely well. Each operation itself is very simple, so you don't need to do anything else. And uh, as you can see, predictions are doing really well. And how you fuse it, that's where you have to use a domain-specific uh, probabilistic model, and that's where the, the Bayesian aspect comes in. Okay? And for both of these, the precise details of the what Bayesian model we have used is available on paper, so you're more than welcome to look at it. Okay. All right, that, let me thank, uh, end here.